All right, people, midweek report time. So this is probably gonna go out usual time on a Thursday, but it's Wednesday night and we're recording this. Um, so obviously if news comes out tomorrow, obviously not gonna be on this video, so we're only going as far as Wednesday because I wanna get midweek report out, but I also wanted to stick with Thursday and I'll be away tomorrow evening. So I'm, I'm around until about four o'clock tomorrow and then I'm heading over to London to look at a few flats and do a few bits and pieces as well might get to attend something who knows might get to do some little bits and pieces as well stay tuned for that that's a work in progress but let's stay tuned for that so we've got a good few days ahead of us and i've got plenty of content build up that i haven't i've finished recording on monday haven't even uploaded well it's uploaded but i haven't got around to uh, making it live that'll go around over the course of the weekend so plenty to do plenty of work it's been a busy week with recording this week a lot of a lot of time and effort has gone in this week so Let's start with let's start with the Fury press conference, the Fury Usek press conference, which just didn't happen to have any members of Team Usek at it. So yeah, there you go. So my two cents on it. Um, right. So I got an email about that press conference about five o'clock on a Monday, and I was like, okay. Why is there a press conference in Morecambe of all places and why is it only Team Fury? So I was kind of like, all right, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I ended up having a chat with Hatman on Elements about it. And I was kind of like, look, I doubt he'll pull out. Nothing would surprise me. You wouldn't announce it as Fury who said press conference and then just say, oh, by the way, it's off. So I was kind of like, well, what, what is this about? And then TNT started plugging it, the zone started plugging it, so I was like, all right, but what is it about? Like, like what, what's the point of this? I don't recall fighters doing press conference before fight week, especially if they've already done a kickoff press conference a month prior. It just didn't make sense to me, and especially doing it in Morecambe of all places. I was kind of like, well, I can understand them not doing it in London because Fury is based in Manchester, make no sense. But Manchester is reasonably close to Morecambe it's about an hour and a bit away but like Morecambe's out the way and I know a lot of the the big channels can get there the IFLs the Boxing King Medias etc but like the smaller independent YouTubers a lot of them work full time and go to events in London and take time off to maybe go Bournemouth or somewhere like that or Manchester on a short notice gig like that you're not going to get many attending you know so it was kind of a bit of a strange one for me and I was like, right, let's have a look see. And I watched it and I was kind of like, well, what was the point of this? <laughs> just, there, there was nothing really that it was, there was nothing really about it that added to it. It was just like, you know, just a, someone someone said in the comment section of the video I did, it was like a bona fide Q and A and it kind of was. And I said that I, I wonder, is it just Fury? Look, Fury may be telling himself, you know, cause Thomas Adamek, he was using to like, a, to describe like a cruiserweight moving up and I was like Thomas Adamek and Alexander Usek it's like chalk and cheese it's not even close so what the so it's almost as if like he's been telling himself Alexander Usek is a cruiserweight when they move to heavyweight they lose trying to say that like Holyfield was Holyfield is one of the best heavyweights much less cruiserweights of all time Holyfield when he fought Lewis was in his mid-30s at the time he'd been champion for three years and really after that he got a fairly contention win over John Ruiz who was not great and then a win over Hasim Rachman which was a, a decent-ish win and that was it they were the only two meaningful wins he got after that so I was kind of like what's he really trying to, to come at here and for me it's just like is he trying to talk himself confident that like you know I am the big man and, and he cannot beat me and uh, for me it was just again I, I just reiterate it was just a really I don't say bizarre thing but it was just kind of like strange because like what is the point of this i i just don't get it it's just a really random thing to do and again for tyson fury to do that and not have any members of team Usek there when it's kind of portrayed as a bit of a fury Usek press conference but just not having alexander Usek there it's like a politician you know trying to say well this is what i've done for the country etc 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 or you know this is what such and such has done in the past and them not being there or not having a representative of their party or team there to say well hang on a minute you know so it, it was a strange one it was a really strange one and yeah i don't know i i really don't know absolutely bizarre one 
In other news, Jerron Boots Ennis has signed a multi-fight promotional deal with Matchroom alongside Eddie Hearn to fight on the zone moving forward, which I think is a great move for Eddie Hearn. I think it's absolutely fantastic that he signed someone the caliber of Boots Ennis, who is an absolutely fantastic, tremendous fighter. He really is. I can't sing the praise of Jerron Boots Ennis enough. I really can't. I think he's tremendous. His athleticism, his power, everything, his speed, it's tremendous. So Eddie Hearn is on to a winner potentially with him there. Certainly one of the best welterweights in the world and maybe a guy who's going to dominate that division and maybe even dominate other divisions and a potential star there. I did wonder when Conor Ben, well, I suppose Conor, Conor Ben does post a lot of stuff and you just take it with a grain of salt. And I was like, yeah, calling out Boots Ennis, you know, better call out Boots Ennis than calling out Kel Brook Manny Pacquiao. But do you have any intention? I wonder now that he's with Matchroom, would he, Eddie Hearn, I mean, look to match Boots Ennis with Conor Ben? Because obviously it's in house. And for Eddie Hearn, it's, I, I just, I get the impression with Eddie Hearn looking to do that Eubank fight and just to deviate so much from the path he had Conor Ben on. I cannot think, like, does he really believe long-term in Conor Ben? And I think with those last two performances, especially the pre, the, the, the last one, I'm sure Eddie Hearn's probably looking and thinking, like, what, what am I going to do with you? You know, I, I can't have you in the UK because it's that UK Bricks and, Bosch board, Bricks and Br- British Boxing Board of Control thing going on. If I can get away in America, could we do something? And can Conor Ben, if he wins, happy days. If he loses, I've got boot tennis. That's the only thing I can think of. I, I genuinely can't make heads or tails of it. Now this right here, <laughs> just why? Isaac Chamberlain has vacated his British title just an hour before the purse bid for his fight with Frey, or sorry, with Chev Clark were ordered, Eddie Hearn revealed. Isaac Chamberlain did go on to make a further statement on that and that he is relinquishing his British title because he has been ordered to challenge uh, Mikhail Seslak for the European title instead and want to take that fight next instead. I can understand wholeheartedly why Chamberlain would want to go up to European level. I can get that. I, I understand that, right? Why wait until the day of the first bit? Like, that's what I was saying. Why wait until the last minute? You know, Mick Hennessy was trying to defend it. Now, obviously, Chamberlain is with Mick Hennessy, and he actually did, he was with Matt Eddie Hearn for a couple of years. I think he left him in 2018, 2019 and he's with Mick Hennessy but he fights on boxer shows and Mick Hennessy was out kind of refuting and saying oh look it, it happens and this that and the third it's another fighter who yeah he's not officially with boxer but he fights on sky he fights on boxer shows Ben Shalom is almost I'm not saying he is I'm saying he's almost like a co-promoter at this point and it's just another case of where a fighter with boxer or associated with boxer has now vacated a title instead of going and fighting the matchroom or a Queensbury fighter. It's happening too much. Now with this one, I can kind of see why they're doing it. Obviously, they're taking a step up a level. Now, if a fighter is in a situation where he's British or European champion, and rather than go ahead and fight his mandatory, he relinquish and goes and fights a challenge a level above for a European or world honor, then I can understand that. I can understand that, to, to be honest, I, I can, and I'm not going to critique it that much, because at the end of the day, they're looking to go and actually level up, and you could argue, I definitely would argue, that Seslak is a harder fight than Chef Clark, i definitely argue that, and it's it, obviously the European title, as, as brilliant as the British title is, a European title will get you a world ranking, it can help you catapult you to world honours, so I get where Chamberlain is coming from there, I, I do, but the fact that it's another boxer fighter, or someone who's associated with boxer, and this has happened again, you know, at a museum, when he vacated that European title rather than fight Dalton Smith, I would probably give Adam Azim and Boxer a pass on that. Had they turned around and said, right, we're vacating the European title, but the reason why we're vacating it is we want to face Subrel Mateus and we're going to look to fight him next or we're going to look to fight Tiafima Lopez next or someone at world title level and maybe a final eliminator. Under those circumstances, I wouldn't class that as a duck because you're actually fighting on paper a more dangerous opponent with a bigger risk potentially and a, but a much higher reward. So you can understand where they're coming from in that sense. But he's fighting Harlem Eubank. Harlem Eubank is not Dalton Smith. I'm sorry, he's not. No disrespect, but he's not. And it seems to me as though ever since Boxer, Boxer have come up short twice now against Queensbury. Joseph Parker, when he was with Boxer, against Joe Joyce, and... I hmm, can't 
can't remember who it was who fought as uh, Ekman or Ekman or something the guy's name was I think that might have been on the undercard of Smith versus Eubank and he came over from Queensbury onto Sky and again I'm thinking Ben Shalom is obviously looking and thinking I want to keep it all in house I don't want my guys losing to guys on the other end of the street as they say in PBC and he wants to keep it all in house but it just looks so bad it's just, it does it genuinely just looks so bad for Ben Shalom it, it really does I'd, I don't know with, with Chamberlain I can kind of I'll look the other way because he genuinely is going up a level so with that I can kind of say alright fair enough but it does look pretty bad at least on Ben Shalom it looks pretty bad Joseph Parker called out Anthony Joshua in a very unique way again this Kerry Russell I think she did or he because you don't know with a name like that he spells it the K. if it's Kerry with an I it's more than likely a woman if it's Kerry with a Y it could be either but um, Kerry Russell done the done this video last week it was take that want you back for good this week it's Ed Sheeran's Lego house and Joseph Parker is doing his best Rupert Grint impression I like his unique style of calling it, of these fighters out he's done Anthony Joshua he's done now uh, Dillian White out of those two I would say the most likely he would get would be Dillian White just because I think with Joshua they're looking to go down the world title road they're looking to fight possibly the winner of her, which Dubois, if that fight happens. I don't think they're looking at a Joseph Parker for a variety of reasons. And, and partially, I would say, because that is a very dangerous, it's a very dangerous rematch. You know, Joseph Parker could well have the beaten of Anthony Josh. I'm not saying I would pick him, but he's a lot more dangerous. I would say out of the tree, I would say, if you were looking at like Hergovich, Parker, Dubois, I would say Parker's most dangerous. For me, anyway. So there was that. Canelo Alvarez versus Munguia. The undercard has taken shape. Mario Barros is on the undercard. Brandon Figueroa versus Jesse Magdaleno. God, Jesse Magdaleno. I remember when he fought Lonita Denaer. That was on the undercard of Pacquiao versus Jesse Vargas. And that was in 2016. And I thought Magdaleno had a bit of potential. He had a year out of the ring. He fought Isaac Dogbe. got battered from pillar to post. And that was the end of it. Magdaleno, I don't even know if he's even 30 years old. Because he was young, um, he just fell by the wayside. And then we have Staniones versus Gabriel Mat Matrizzi, I think say say that guy's name. Staniones was meant to fight or Ortiz a couple of times, never got that fight. So, yeah, some names in the welterweight division. Um, and lighter than I think Frank Figueroa was 130 or 135, one or the other. So yeah, it's not terrible undercard. Canelo undercards are normally not their strongest. They're, they're normally not the best. You know, they, they normally aren't. What else do we have here? Dave Benavidez has told reporters that he plans to attend Canelo Alvarez versus Jaime Munguia on May the 4th. I'm looking forward to that fight now, I have to say. I genuinely am. And this was where it was on Instagram a few days ago. On Monday, Conor Ben posting Boots versus, or Ben versus Ennis. So... Yeah, if Ben is now, or if Ennis is now a matchroom fighter, well then, well then, that's interesting. So, Ben versus Ennis, if they did do it, I wouldn't give Conor Ben, a, a, I'd give a snowball a better chance of surviving a day in hell than I would Conor Ben beating Boots Ennis, quite frankly. But you never know, it's boxing, strange things happen, and upsets do happen when you least expect them. But um, I wouldn't be going, I wouldn't be saying, I wouldn't be picking him for the upset now, to be honest with you. Anthony Yard, uh, basically Anthony Yard released this video, all right? Now, I've already done a video on it, but I'll talk about it now in more depth, right? Anthony Yard done a video where he's saying that to Joshua Boatze, they're about to negotiate a fight as he revealed his promotional contract with Frank Warren has now expired. That means basically he's a free agent. So with Anthony Yard, what do I think he should do? What do I think he should do? Whoever pays him the most money and gives him the best opportunity, that's who we should go with, whether that's Warren, whether that's uh, Eddie, whether that's Ben, whether that's GBM, because they're up and coming, or whether that's, so, say, Bob or whoever, Oscar, whoever, whoever can give him the most money and the best opportunities on paper anyway, that's who we should go with. He's always had a good relationship with Frank Warren. I would wonder if that video, the purpose of that video is to kind of give Frank a bit of a, you know, kick up the backside to say, come on, Frank, get me re-signed. Because he is the only real decent light heavyweight Frank Warren has in their stable. And if he is looking to do the Matchroom versus Queensbury show, obviously they're doing a light heavyweight, I think Eddie Hearn gets picked. That's a guaranteed slam dunk win for Eddie Hearn, isn't it? Because you got Callum Smith and Craig Richards, two very good light heavyweights, both of whom I would say 
Well, I, I would pick Yard over Richards. Callum Smith be interesting, but uh, you look at like his stable. Zach Parker's really a one sixty. He doesn't, but he's no business at light heavyweight. Zach Parker and Willie Hutchinson, who again is no great shakes at light heavyweight in the nicest possible way. So I wouldn't pick either of them over over uh, Callum Smith or for that matter Craig Richards. So I say Anthony Yard or say Frank Warren is thinking. I'll add another zero and will you come back to Queensbury? They've always had a good relationship, Frank and Anthony. They seem to, you know, like a bit like an uncle and a nephew and a the father son relationship. Frank's always seemed to get on and seems to have a very good relationship with Yard. They've gone to Arsenal games together, they're both fans of Arsenal. And they, I think Frank Warren seems like if you support Arsenal, you'll be in his good books. If you're a fighter. If you support Arsenal, you seem to be in his good books. Boots Ennis has asked if he'd welcome a fight versus Conor Ben. He says, I'll fight anybody. I don't care who it is. I'm excited about collecting all the belts to become undisputed. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, so a lot of talk from Boots Ennis. It's going to be interesting to see what he does. It's really going to be interesting to see what he does. In terms of fights this weekend, let's do a quick preview. I'm not really, you know, the matchroom show this weekend, it's not amazing. It's not, it's not their best show. I'll put it like that on paper. But let's do a quick preview of it. See what we have, and let's let's, let's try and let's see what we can do. So Jordan Gill makes his return to the ring. They got to bear in mind Jordan Gill last time around fought and stopped Michael Conlon. I did not see that coming. I thought Conlon would have to beat the Jordan Gill. I was I was proven very wrong there. In terms of this card here, um, right, 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 right. Um, Michael Gomez Jr. versus Kane Baker. That'll be a good fight. Kane Baker is one of those journeymen. He always comes to win. He always comes to make a go of it. He always comes to have a fight. Michael Gomez Jr. is always in a fight. So that's going to be a good fight. Um, Rihanna Dixon. Rihanna Dixon is not... <laughs> she is not the most fun to watch. I've seen one or two of Rihanna Dixon's fights. Um, yeah. Not... Not the most fun female fighter in the world to watch, really. Ellie Scottney is in a unification. Ellie Scottney is cool. Ellie Scottney is cool. I've had a couple of very brief DM conversations with her and stuff like that. So, But she is cool. Ellie, Ellie Scottney is cool. Um, and I have seen a couple of her fights. And she's not terrible. She's not terrible. In terms of women boxing, she's pretty good. Then we have Jordan Gill versus Elfa Barrett as the main event. I do like the fight Jordan Gill, Zelfa Barrett. You know, Zelfa Barrett is always kind of... He's always struggled to bridge that gap to world level. I remember his loss to Ronnie Clark way back a few years ago now. And I remember that was, it was really sad that Ronnie Clark, he had to try and sell that IBF. He won a trick at IBF title, European title, like European IBF title. I remember he had to try and sell that because financially he was struggling a bit. And I hope he's okay. That was sad that was a really good performance by Ronnie Clark as well. And then he lost to that Rakimov guy in nine rounds. That was so bizarre. That was on the yeah, that was on the undercard of Bivol versus Ramirez. That was such a bizarre fight because he was winning. And it just seemed to capitulate really quick. It was really it was honestly quite bizarre in that fight. Um gun to my head, who do I think will win that fight? Personally, I think Zelfa Barrett will win. Because I think he's fresher. I know Jordan Gill looked good against Michael Conlon. But Conlon, I, I think his chin is just shot to pieces. I really do. I think his chin is, is probably like Dylan White, a heavyweight now, where it's been dented and it's just never going to be fully right. Because Jordan Gill got stopped by Kiko Martinez. Kiko Martinez retired not long after. Jordan Gill has had that... Michael, they had a common opponent. Conlon stopped him in a round. Jordan Gill was on the verge of getting stopped and pulled that big left hook out in round nine. I can't remember his name, but... I wouldn't imagine... I would, I would be going with Zelfa Barrett. I think he's fresher. What else do we have? What else do we have? Uh, Tyson Fury jabs Vladimir Klitschko for advising Alexander Rusek how to beat him. Yeah, a lot of people are, are taking that. So basically, Klitschko lost to Tyson Fury. And he lost convincingly. And they're saying, well, what can Klitschko add? Well, you can learn enough about someone when you're in the ring with them. Even if you lose, you can give a little bit of insight. You know, I remember in the, if you ever watched documentary, I Am Ali, they say that when he went to fight George Foreman, bear in mind he was trained by Angie Dundee. Who did he reach out to and ask, who do you beat George Foreman? And he came out and he went to Customato. And I remember hearing stories about Customato. 
saying about when you look at like someone like a Rocky Marciano, when you look at like Don Cockle, what he did, and then bear in mind Don Cockle lost to Rocky Marciano, but the way he was able to just swarm in on Marciano was saying like that's how you beat them. You know, some people just have to, even if they lose, and I know because uh, Tomato wasn't obviously he wasn't obviously fighting these guys or anything, we never fought Rocky Marciano or anyone like that, but you know what I mean. Just because you shared the ring with him, you might have lost, but you can still give a little bit of insight. You can say, right, well, in the ring with him, this is what I found. This is what he does well. This is what you need to look out for, even if you lost. So I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't look and say, well, Klitschko lost to Fury. So that means, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, him advising Usyk is a bad thing necessarily. When cruiserweights step up, they're usually found wanting from Tyson Fury. I've already talked about that and how, well, no that's not the case you know again he used Holyfield like Holyfield has one of the most impressive even a heavyweight has one of the most impressive careers tremendous resume you know Holyfield is one of the greatest if not the greatest cruiserweight of all time David Hay David Hay was always going to be a bit limited at heavyweight Thomas Adamek had no business at heavyweight you know didn't mention Steve Cunningham interestingly um, and then Steve Cunningham didn't do much at heavyweight but there are, there are even cruiserweights now you look at like Jay Apataya and you think a heavyweight he's going to cause problems big problems because you got to remember they're taking a lot of them with their speed with them and that can believe me the coordination and the speed of a cruiserweight can cause a lot of heavyweight problems and Alexander Usyk has already beaten Anthony Joshua you know an elite big man well I would consider Anthony Joshua an elite big man and Alexander Usyk twice was not found wanting against Anthony Joshua what else do we have here? What else do we have here? Fabio Wadley confirms rematch with Fraser Clark remains an option. I'd like to see him go down and do that. I'd like to see him go and take that rematch. Lewis Neary calls a nail in a way overrated. <laughs> oh, mate, really? Yeah, overrated my you-know-what, my backside. <laughs> overrated, really, mate. You're, just, you're not fooling anyone with that. My guy has done Undisputed twice in jig time. Okay. George Cambosis knows stakes are high against Vasily Lomachenko. George Cambosis shouldn't be in there with Lomachenko. It should have been Maxi Hughes. It should have. Maxi Hughes beat. He, again, Maxi Hughes, bad decision. Beat George Cambosis. What does he get in, re in reward? Gets his ass kicked by William Zapata. That's, that's it, basically. What else, what else, what else? I don't think there's much else. Oh, yes, actually, I meant to say, Jared Anderson is fighting this weekend. I forgot to preview his fight. Jared Anderson. Uh, because that is going to be a decent fight. And he's fighting that guy, R Rhea Mari or something his name is. The guy who fought Tony Yoka. I think it was in uh, Yoka's last fight and he got a win. A very close fight, but he got a win nonetheless. Who else is on the undercard? Ruben Villa. He's always fun. It's always fun to watch. Who else? Who else? F.A. Jagba versus Guido v Villano. Villano. I think it's how you say that guy's name. He's already taken an L against Jonathan Rice. I've seen a couple of his fights. And yeah, he's no great shakes whatsoever. I mean, he fought Curtis Harper. I mean, Curtis Harper, he is as old as dirt now at this stage. How old is Curtis? Only 35? Jesus, I thought he was older than that. He's been around forever, Curtis Harper. I would imagine Jagba's going to win that. And I will be picking Anderson over Mary. Now, yeah, Mary is coming in. He beat Tony Oka, lost to Lorena, and he lost to Gullamarian in 11. And Gullamarian is all right, but no great shakes. That was down a cruiser. So I'd be favoring Big Baby in this fight. I would. I'd be favoring him heavily. I think Big Baby is a very talented fighter, a very talented young man. He just needs to make sure his head is in the right place. He really does. So I think that's it. So I will leave it there. I will talk to you well i have videos planned for the weekend so i will probably talk to you at some point over the weekend with a nice little hotel background i know some people like the hotel backgrounds that i stay in i like how they in hotels i love i love the hotel i love i love, love seeing them what can i say i like a bit of comfort as well so i like to get the, i like getting a nice hotel you know nice one but yeah i will leave it there i hope you enjoyed it smash the like button if you could hit subscribe of course if you haven't already i will be back here next week but you will obviously get some pre-recorded videos q a I recorded it monday gonna upload that probably sometime lunchtime on friday that went just uh, just over 50 minutes so you've just got over a 50 minute q a to look forward to and i will talk to you when i talk to you until then
Peace.